welcome back to the Inpital lecture series on bioelectricity. So, we have finished uh, 8 lectures, now we are into the ninth lecture. In the last lecture, we talked about the microelectrode array and I requested you people please go online and check the real image of a microelectrode array. So, one of the things what people are currently trying to do. So, we will briefly talk about the applications of microelectrode array what people are trying to do. So, and then we will move on to the intracellular recording. So, one of the things what needs bit of a visualization is that think of this whole brain it is thousands and thousands and thousands of neuron making multiple circuits out there. So, something like that if you have to visualize the brain it will be something like this. For example, if this is your brain and this is the brain stem and here you have the brain. Okay. Now, at any point if you pick up any particular point and if you magnify it what essentially you will see there will be series of neurons like this sitting out there uh, functionally dynamic state. It is a complex network something like this and in between you have the glial cells and likewise series of supporting cells something like this. So, at one point of time in this network it has been estimated that one neuron receives could receive have the ability to receive signals from 10,000 other neurons. In other word what that translates down into at one point of time a neuron on its surface has 10,000 synapses something like this. So, for example, if this is single neuron and this is the axon okay. and here you have the dendritic tree something like this. Okay. This is the nucleus. Okay. So, this neuron at one point can receive signal from say 10,000 different sources like this. I could only draw certain visible space I have I mean I have limited space I cannot draw all of them. So, just to show you so, one of the critical challenge of the modern neuroscience as a whole is how really to understand how a network functions, because in a complex brain it is exceptionally challenging. Most of the time when you insert an electrode what you record is a field potential. What I meant by field potential is that say for example, I have a electrode say I am showing it by like this I have this electrode out there this electrode will only measure something like this. Okay. In this region the all the activities which are taking place out here in a broad region that is all it does. Okay. So, a electrode recording like that cannot really pinpoint what is happening at a small loci like this or it cannot really pinpoint the cellular events which are taking place. What you are getting is something uh, aggregation of say 10,000 neurons at one spot or like you know 5,000 neuron. Of course, it depends on how smaller is the size of your electrode, how finer the electrode is you get a field study. The summation of the electrical activities of a population of neuron that is essentially is, is helpful for several to understand the rhythms and several uh, circa, um, circadian activities and all those there are several things sleep and all those things, but that is not really the way you can figure out uh, what exactly is happening at individual cells. Say for example, I have a drug which is targeted to a specific kind of neuron or say for example, I have a drug which is getting into the brain I have no idea what is what it is doing at the individual cell. For that you need different approach. So, most of these approaches depends on in vitro culture model. What does that mean? There are two ways how you can approach. 
uh, use the electrical power or the bioelectrical techniques for understanding biological phenomena. Uh, one is that you insert an electrode or you poke an electrode in a live animal. This is one way, where the live animal, the animal is moving around and you are recording. In a real time, you are recording the events which are taking place. That is one way, which is nevertheless is the one of the most powerful, profound way to do it. But that will not give you any idea as I was mentioning about individual cell what is happening. In order to understand individual cell, you have to go down to at the cellular level and that you cannot do in a live system. Then you have to either take out a part of the tissue outside the system, you can make a slice, you can do a slice on the slice, you can keep the slice alive for 6 to 10 hours and on that slice you can do recordings. There is another way, where you place the slice on a micro electrode array, what I have shown last time. So, in that situation what you are essentially doing is, you are keeping the cyto architecture intact. So, for graphical representation what I am trying to tell you. So, these are the different uh, techniques. So, this is a live animal. Say for example, if this is uh, these are recording techniques, okay. Live animal recording. So, you have electrode either implanted like this or you have surface electrode like this and the animal is alive. This is a spinal cord likewise you know and essentially what you are recording are the field potentials. The other set of recording out here, which is in the, you cannot do it in the live animal. So, this will give you field potential of a population of neuron. So, the drawbacks, if I had to say the drawback, just putting drawback as uh, drawback as d b hmm? do not provide info or information for cellular event ok. Then this takes us to the next level, how to understand cellular event ok how to understand cellular event. For cellular event, you need to have what we call in vitro recording and what we essentially call this technique as in vivo or in animal recording. Okay. So, to do in vitro recording. So, in the next slide we are moving the different techniques of in vitro recording. So, say for example, if I look at all the excitable tissues. So, one of them is your brain and the spinal cord, then you have the heart, here is the brain, I mean see. So, you essentially you have two major techniques, one is slice recording other one is dissociated dissociated cell culture recording what we meant by slice recording so, in the next slide we will talk about what we meant by slice record. So, say for example, this is the part, this is the brain, you anesthetize the animal, you remove the brain and you kill the animal. Okay. 
and we know that this is one of the areas which is called hippocampus which is involved in learning and memory okay campus we'll talk more about it while we'll be talking about learning and memory okay involved in learning and memory so what you do essentially you take out that organ like this okay and then you make slices something like you make slices like this so do you essentially get you can make slices in a different in different ways so do you essentially get a very thin tissue like this and then you put them in a chamber emulating the condition of the brain I mean like if the, if, the, if the tissue is sitting like this so if here is the extracellular fluid with different energy source to make this tissue survive and then you approach and already the cyto architecture is all maintained just to mention slice recording okay slice recording okay and advantage cyto architecture is intact and then on that what you are getting you are putting the electrodes which are shown in black so like this and you start doing the recording okay so this is essentially is talking about the slice recording and slice recording is uh, very popular because your architecture remains intact you can really poke the so the circuit remains intact you can really poke the electrode at a specific zone of the circuit and stimulate one circuit and say for example in this diagram if i just highlight this further so it will be something like this if this is the part of the tissue say for example if this is the hippocampus okay which is almost like this okay and it is known that hippocampus has something like this okay so hippocampus has different circuits in on its system something like the ca1 ca2 ca3 these are the circuits within hippocampus we will come in depth on this one okay afterward so now what you can do in order to study these different circuits and connectivity you can poke electrode here you can stimulate here you can do a recording from here or you can poke an electrode here you can do a simultaneous recording from here or you can do it from here or you can from here likewise or you can stimulate here and you see how it is distributing on both sides likewise and you can put multiple electrode so this is another advantage and you can even do you can do two kinds of recording here you can do a sharp electrode recording which I have already talked sharp electrode and you can also do something called which I have not discussed yet patch clamp recording. Okay. We have not discussed about it, but this I definitely discussed with people and some people even try to take this whole circuit and take this whole slice and put it on top of a micro electrode array on a planar EMEA. This whole circuit is placed on a planar EMEA as if you guys have seen it, it something looks like this. Please again I request you kindly go online and check the structure that will help you 
and the circuit sits like this something like this. So, you see so these are different techniques which are being used to understand the functioning of the brain by extracellular. So, this is what I showed you in a planar microelectrode array is a extracellular pattern of recording then you could have intracellular electrode and you could have patch clamp, patch clamp I have not discussed with you before what I am going to discuss after this. Okay. So, this is one way, but there is another way which is the third way and which is. So, you have to realize the drawback of uh, slice recording is this slice recording cannot uh, last a slice cannot last more than 6 to 10 hours. It is really tough because it is a three dimensional tissue out there which is already taken out from the system it is not really adapted. So, for maybe you can make it last for 18 hours maybe maybe a day if you are exceptionally good, but the problem is that whenever we talk about drug trials chronic situation chronic experiments the story changes why the story changes because you have to realize that say for example, I put a drug and drug will be acting over a period of months and maybe sometime years. And most of the animal trials are really costly whenever and on a long term effects at the cellular level at times get law get missed. So, say for example, if you go back to the slides where I was showing you the real animal situation. Say for example, I inject a drug into this animal. Okay. Now, this is circulating all over the body all over the place. Okay. So, it is really tough to know exactly what is happening at the individual cellular level and over a period of time how it works. So, chronic experiments are really tricky and really tough to do and on top of that with animal ethics and the cost of animal every drug discovery really takes a huge amount of funding huge and that is why when the drug comes into the market it becomes so costly. It is not costly because this drug is out of the world it is costly because it has to go through all the different channels of screening and those screening takes enormous money enormous amount of funding is required. So, that capital investment essentially jack up the price of a drug when it comes to the market. So, now coming back what is the other technique? And especially these these kind of drugs are exceptionally costly when you talk about the nervous system or the cardiac system, which are kind of you know pretty much your lifeline, a cardiac drug. It is not easy, I mean it is it is really tricky, okay. You have to go through all possible channels of hoops before the drug kind of gets into the system. So, coming back uh, where we were about the uh, what is the third technique. So, we talked about the slice recording. Now, we will talk about the third set of recording which is fairly old yet fairly new also but there are two aspects of it. What you do essentially here. So, from this diagram itself let us start to draw what you do here say for example, I wanted to have understand about the hippocampus. Uh, what I will do is that I will pull out the hippocampus I will break the hippocampus in the sense I will dissociate the cells of the hippocampus by doing by using different enzymes or different mechanical ways. So, if you look at this circuit now, so at the cellular level if you try to look at this circuit, this circuit is essentially nothing but a series of neurons sitting like this. Okay, like this thousands and thousands of neurons are sitting like this and they are making circuit at different level and this is just the top top layer I am showing in multiple layers and likewise. And they are arranged in a specific array specific circuit and everything. Okay. Now, what we do is that you take this hippocampus take this out take this whole thing out or you can take even part of it if you are very good at dissection or something. Okay. Then you take this out and so 
for example, you have collected that part of the tissue out here likewise in an extracellular fluid, then you break the tissue okay. and this breaking of the tissue is called dissociation. Dissociation of tissue into single cell suspension. What we mean by single cell suspension? It means, now you have all these individual component what I was drawing are separated out something like this. Okay. In that process of course, the tissue undergo a lot of damage or something, but those which survive are important for you. And now, you take these neurons and the accessory cells depending on you have different modes that you can purify. At this stage you can, so if you have the neural tissue in case of say neural tissue you can neural tissue, you can purify the neural tissue, you can have the glial cells separated which are the supporting cells, you have the neurons separated out and then you put them in a dish to grow. Of course, they would not grow just in the thin air, you need to do a bit of a homework, you have to coat this dish with something on which they prefer to go, some kind of substrate on which these neurons will grow. Okay. So, this is the substrate and on top of the substrate, you have the neurons growing like this. So, if you get a top view of this something like a top view and it will look like this, neurons are all over the place likewise. Okay. It will be a random connection between different neurons okay. this is a dissociated neuronal culture. Okay. So, these dissociated neuronal culture, now you can approach the individual cell with individual electrode. You can have a sharp electrode like this, you can approach the individual cell and you can monitor several events. You could put x y z compounds out here, say for example, compound A, compound B likewise you know have this another compound out here or a third compound out here likewise okay and we can figure out their figure out what they do okay so this technique gives you an access to the individual cell in a dissociated culture this is what it does but it comes with a drawback drawback is that I told you in the previous uh, slice preparation, the cyto architecture is maintained. In other words, if you go back, so the circuit is all maintained out here, okay. circuit is not getting destroyed, but out here what you did once you dissociate everything, the there is a random connectivity. You do not have really a control on their connectivity. Okay. So, there is a random connect connectivity. Okay. So, this network is forming in a very, very random manner. You really cannot dictate that how many synapses are forming. You really cannot have any control, but eventually it becomes really cumbersome to detect. Say for example, think of a practical situation. Uh, if this is I label it as A and I label this as B, this as C, this is D, this is E this is f, this is g, this is h, this is i and j likewise. Now, say for example, a signal is getting originated from here and I am seeing the signal is all over the place. Now, I really do not know how the signal has moved. I really cannot trace it, because signal may move like this signal may move like this, signal may move like this, signal may take a back turn and likewise signal may have a connectivity like this. So, there is no way I can figure out how the network exactly functions. 
So, network behavior is really tricky, it is almost the same situation as when you do a field potential measurement. You really have no control about the number of cells which will be involved in generating that signal. So, you really do not know and moreover you really cannot in a random circuit, it is really difficult to keep a tab at the changes at individual synapses because at individual synapse it is again getting connectivity from multiple sources, because it is random. There is no way that you can control that connectivity, because anything can form connection with anybody. So, that makes the story very complex, that is something you do not wish to happen. But you need technology, now if you need to have a directed or you know completely patterned growth, you need some different kind of technology. Then it starts within this dissociated culture, the current technology which most of the people in the area of bioelectricity or bioelectrical recordings are following. So, they are trying to develop build circuits out of this dissociated cell, how they are doing so. So, coming back to the basics again. So, I drew that, I told you that there is a substrate. Okay. So, for example, let us try to understand it. Say for example, I, you have a culture substrate like this. Imagine this is the culture substrate, all the cells will grow on it everywhere. Okay. Fine. Okay. On this culture substrate, say for example, if you have a way that you could uh, introduce some pattern, say for example, you do something like this, okay. you ablate these part of the circuit. What I meant by ablation means, I am removing that particular yellow color compound from here. So, if you remove the yellow, nothing will grow there, provided you backfill it with something which won't promote. So, essentially, what you are getting now, look at it. So, essentially, now the cells, so say for example, I backfill it, what I meant by that, on this, on these zones, you fill it with another, another something. So, on black I really cannot draw anything, because everything will, let me see if I can do it with red. Okay. This is the back filling agent. So, that is ensuring that or those ablated surface. So, what we, okay, those who are not understanding ablation, let me just explain. What you do essentially, you, one second. So, what you essentially do is, say for example, you have the substrate like this, you take a mask and if imagine this is the substrate and I have the mask, I keep the mask here. Okay. If I keep the mask here and I put a laser beam or something, so at this part where the mask is covering it, nothing will get ablated. Okay rest of the places will all get ablated. Does that make sense? So, that is exactly what I am trying to tell you. What I, I say for example, I put a mask, the zone which were exposed to the laser beam are the one which are black. So, it burns out those spots, what is left with all the yellow, but things will grow. And now, where you have the black spots, there what you do is that you backfill it you dip it in such a solution, which will only sit on top of those ablated region, that compound would not sit on top of the yellow. Okay. So, then that is what I am trying to do. So, this is that next compound, by which you ensure this black compound is the one, which will not allow any cellular growth at that particular black surface. Okay. Likewise, okay. now you have a pattern situation. Okay this pattern situation will allow the neurons to grow 
like this. So, the neurons could grow if their thickness is like this something like this. If this thickness is good enough for a neuron to grow and there may be connectivity coming out like this possibilities are there, but there are ways to you know control that. Now, what you are seeing essentially is you are trying to control the motion the position of the neuron and you really can do it in a very interesting way. There are several geometries which you can follow. So, this is one geometry I showed you. So, this is done by a technique which is called laser ablation. You ablate it using laser. Okay. There is another way you can do it. You can make these circuits using your old style inkjet printers. What you do is that you print the circuit. So, for example, you on your word document you draw the circuit, narrow it down, and on the cartridge where you fill the old inkjet printer, you fill the fill the uh, ink, you throw away the ink, sterilize it, and on top of that you put inside that uh, a you put the either the substrate you want to do. So, what you will do the jet printer will make say for example, a circuit like this. So, for example, I want a circuit like this, I want the cells to grow like this. Okay. So, it will make a circuit like this or it can even make a circuit like only lines okay. or it can make a circuit like or it can make a circuit like this. So, there are several ways you can make circuits and these are some of the different ways what I am trying to highlight okay. and you can control the dimension. So, for this I would recommend you kindly go through some of these extra materials which I expect you to see the papers of uh, for micro contact printing one of the pioneering person micro contact printing. You should refer to the work of Professor Thomas Boland. Currently, he is in University of Texas at El Paso. Professor Tao Zhu. These people have done very significant of amount of work on microcontact printing, and it's worth reading some of their work, how they have done it using very, very simple and most of these work were published during 2003 to 2010. Now, also some of the work they are publishing and they are absolutely phenomenal. I mean the, the way they have done all these things is just with very crude um, uh, I should say very crude uh, techniques around them. They could really do very nice micro contact printing and uh, some very well uh, documented papers are there from their side. Okay. So, this is a one groups paper I like you people to look at it for laser ablation and all these work. I expect you please go through the work of there are few people whose work will be really looking one will be one second one paper by this is one of the very old paper uh, Kleinfield in journal of neuroscience. It is a very seminal paper in Kleinfields and you should go through the work of James J. Hickman. He has done extensively extensive work in that area. Then you should look through the work of uh, Bruce Wheeler, who also has done very significant amount of work in this area, and then you have Gregory Brewer. These are the people who have done significant amount of research in this area, and uh, it's definitely I will recommend you people please go through some of their work. They have worked in wide areas, but 
definitely they have made some seminal contribution in these kind of printing circuits. So, current status is like this with this I mean you can go to the other end of the world. So, there are techniques which are being used in laser ablation then there is something called photolithography and this will get a lot of references in Professor Hickman's work lithography and Professor Brewer's work and Professor Kleinfeld's work okay. and of course, uh, uh, Professor Bruce Wheeler's work. Okay. So, we talked about the micro contact printing, where you should look through the work of Professor Thomas Boland and um, there are a few other people who have done uh, very significant work. I will come back to that in the next lecture. So, these people have shown that they actually can guide the neuron in a specific trajectory a single neuron. So, you will see some of these circuits like you know you can nowadays you can develop like you know two neuron circuit like this. These are you will see these kind of circuits are being developed single two neuron. So, now in these two neuron you can really approach with a single electrode you can have x y or z compounds all over the place. You can really quantify the synapse. So, what all you can do? You can quantify synapse 1, you can do chronic experiment for a long period of time and this chronic experiment could be these, these circuits could survive for more than a month or so you know if you are really good at it. So, they may okay, chronic experiment you can quantify the synapse you can do cheap drug trials they reduce down the cost of drug trials on top of that you can introduce the supporting cells like you know the glial cells. So, you can study the glial cells dynamics and on top of that here is a control model where you can study learning and memory. So, these kind of control circuits and you can make series of them I mean as you as the, the authors whose papers I have mentioned you or the those who have made seminal contribution if you read through these papers you will realize you can make series of such circuit to approach a single cell in a very elegant way and you can really understand the network behavior in a very uh, I should say in a very simplistic reductionist approach. Of course, it comes with its drawback because you are rebuilding the circuit. So, you know there will be some error here and there, but the way biology works is that you start from whole animal you come at the single cell level and then it all has to merge. So, there is no one technique which is perfect and there can never be one technique which is perfect. So, the whole idea is you know having multiple techniques trying to tell you or trying to unravel the truth of nature. This is what we are always trying all throughout like you know we are trying different techniques. So, this is one approach. So, another approach in that same line which is an hybrid approach is which is being followed going to draw is uh, I, I introduce you to the microelectrode arrays. Okay. Let me draw a microelectrode array and tell you what is that approach. It is a very interesting approach where say for example, you have these microelectrode arrays sitting out here like this. Now, you may have electrodes like this. So, if you can pattern this say for example, I have a pattern like this say um, ok fine I have a pattern like this the cells will follow this trajectory. ok.
something like this. Okay. Now, and I connect this like this. Okay. So now, rest of the places where you see yellow are the only places where the cells will grow. Rest of the places, cells will not grow. So I modify the surface of this planar microelectrode array in such a way that cells will grow all along those electrodes, they are connecting the electrodes and the dimension of the electrode is say 20 to 30 microns okay. and the, those lines say for example, the aspect ratio of you know 10 to 20 microns or maybe 10 microns okay. and specifically except the places where the electrodes are their aspect is slightly more. Maybe this is say 20 micron and the lines are say 5 micron thick. So, on a 5 micron surface it is really tough for a cell to sit, but the cells will preferentially will sit on top of the electrodes, because these electrode regions have more surface area. So, around 30 microns or 20, 20, 20 to 25 microns. Okay. So, when you put the dissociated cells into this chamber, what will happen? So, if for example, I put the if I represent the cells by you know, if I represent the cells with red. So, now I am putting the cells into it. So, cells will preferentially will try to sit here because these are the zones where they will try to migrate to on top of the electrodes, because that is where they will get the maximum surface area to grow. Okay. But these are all dissociated cells. Okay. So, once they will sit like this, what they will try to do, they will try to you know send out processes like this, they will try to send out processes like this to connect with each other. They can do it in like this, like this, several ways they can do. You can even stimulate this circuit in order for this whole process to take place and they will form a very controlled network, a network which you can monitor in a real life, okay. something like this. So, they will start forming network inside you keep this whole th the system inside an incubator and you monitor it as they are forming the network. Once they are forming the network. So, what you can do? You can give an external stimulation for network formation and stimulation and you can register the electrodes. Okay. Say for example, I registered them as E 1, E 2, okay, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Okay. So, I can register the electrodes and you really can monitor the activity at the individual channels. Okay. And the individual channels of the amplifier you can monitor the activity what is happening in which electrode. Now, once the network is firm, say for example, I give a signal out here. I give an a stimulation out here. Now, how this stimulation is moving along this circuit, I can monitor in a real time. How the how the synapses are forming out here, how the synapses are forming here, how it is forming here, how which circuit is getting more strengthened, how it is getting more strengthened. I can study all these things now. What and then based on that, I can back calculate what is probably happening in the brain. Okay. So, if you look at it, there are profound scopes which is open up with the advancement of uh, modern microelectronics. We are able to access a single neuron on top of an electrode and these are all could be done using extracellular recording. These are all extracellular planar MEA or microelectrode array recording. Okay. So, this is the advantage which microelectrode array offers in order to study the circuit from a very reductionist approach. It is not an holistic approach, it is a very very reductionist approach 
you are building the system from the base again from grassroots you are brick by brick you are building the system. Okay. So, I will close in here for this class and in the next class we will talk about the other end of the intracellular recording where we will be approaching a single ion channel because once I will introduce the ion channel then I will talk to you about the structures and the details of the ion channels. Thanks a lot.